You got a new book out. Yep. Okay. So, I mean, you've been around for a very long time, you know, being one of the founders of, of Southern Hip Hop. Why did you decide at this point to put a book out? Well, I think it was important to put a book out right now uh, because, you know, people just don't know my history, you know, and uh, people don't know that I'm, you know, I'm the one who created Southern Hip Hop. They don't know I went to the Supreme Court for Hip Hop. They don't know I was the first person to have a record ban uh, deemed obscene by a federal judge. And if I did not fight and win that case, then uh, rappers right now today wouldn't be able to say the things that they say on the record without going to jail or getting their record taken off the off the shelf. And uh, people just need to know that, you know, I revolutionized the game of, of hip hop as well as music from the standpoint of, of artists wanting to own their own record labels. You know, when I first did this, all the other artists were happy to, about being on their own, uh, happy about being on a, another person's label. You know, and uh, once I started doing the music, had my own label, you know, everybody else pretty much uh, piggybacked off what I did. So, you know, the story has never been told. You know, uh, BET, MTV, none of these people of the world uh, ain't planning on telling the story no time soon. There's 25 years in the game. You know, I've been in, 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 the, in the business of more, and it hasn't been told, so I think it's the perfect time right now. I agree. So let, let's talk about the beginning part. So you are actually the first person in the South to start a hip-hop label. Is that accurate? Yes, that is. Okay, so what, what made you suddenly come up with an idea of, you know something, I, I'm not going to sign to whatever the big record label is at the time. I'm going to actually create my own record label without actually having any record label experience. Well, when, when, I mean, when you read the book, and I talk about it in the book, uh, how I fell into it. You know, my, my whole goals were to be a DJ on the radio, uh, a, a, a great promoter like Al Heyman. That was my whole thing. You know, that's what I wanted to be. You know, and, uh, you know, I was bringing down hip-hop artists from T. Rock to you name it. Uh, uh, Jekyll and Hyde, uh, you, you, uh, Mantronics. I brought all these different guys down here, and I was bringing hip hop down. And I was promoting at skating rinks, and uh, and high school dances and things like that. So you know, I ended up, uh, you know, as, as as a DJ, you know, as a mobile DJ, you know, we would create different dances, and I talk about it in the book. And uh, one dance we created was throw the D. And at the time, uh, I brought down uh, Two Live Crew. I said, we need to do a, a song. You guys do a song based on this dance here. And uh, they eventually did the song. Uh, nobody wanted to put it out. So I then made it my point of saying, OK, I like the song. You know, I break records every week here in Miami, you know, and uh, I put my money behind it. So I kind of got in the music business by default. It wasn't a thing of me wanting to be in the business. I basically uh, uh, got in the business by default. I mean, the story kind of sounds similar to the Easy E story when you say it like that. Mm hmm. You know, in terms of someone who's not really trying to be a rapper, trying to be in a hip hop group, but sort of ends up in a hip hop group. And even though you weren't really the rapper, you were like the biggest personality in the group. Yeah, I, I, I didn't want to be in the group either. You know, once I put the, I mean, when you read the book, once I put the record out, you know, once I put the album out, you know, it was a single at that period of time. Uh, and then I started distributing it myself. I started taking it to flea markets. I started taking it to different places and I started sending out the different record pools that I was involved in, you know, and getting records. And before you know it, uh, you know, I had to tell, you know, uh, which I talk about in the book, I had to tell the, you know, the distributors, the distributor guys taught me how to distribute the music. And then I, you know, I wanted my money from that. And then I was going to be done with the music business, hoping that that would help springboard their career and to possibly getting a better deal. And then, you know, the, the distributors told me I had to get them another record in order to get my money from the first record. So I eventually ended up in the business, you know, and, uh, at that period of time, I had no goals of wanting to be an uh, uh, artist on the, uh, on, on, a part of the group, you know, and uh, eventually, you know, I ended up in the group because 
now that I've changed, you know, the sound and the production and the style of the group, you know, the group wanted me, you know, Mr. Mix wanted me to be a part of it, doing what I do as a DJ in Miami uh, on the shows. And so before you know it, long story short, I ended up in the group and I ended up being the spokesperson of the group and owning the record company as well. I remember as a, as a hip hop fan, during the time of like move something and we want some pussy, like me and my friends had the cassette and we were listening to it. But it was really just like the hip hop kids were listening to it and there weren't a lot of hip hop kids. Hip hop was still really like an underground kind of thing. It wasn't really played on the radio. So the kids who were sort of in on it were, were fucking with it. But then once Me So Horny came out and all the, all the attention from the authorities, that's when I think that Two Life Crew really just got blown up. Would that be accurate? Well, you know, yes, because, you know, once we start, you know, we did Throw the Dick, the song, and then eventually uh, we got a little heat from that. That's when I created the parental advisory sticker, something people don't know, you know, because that hasn't been written about. Uh, and I basically created that sticker because parents were complaining that the that the kids were buying the adult version of the songs, which I had no intentions of kids purchasing. Uh, so I created the sticker, told my salespeople to tell the record stores, hey, look, this one with the sticker is the adult version, and the one without the sticker is the clean version. And uh, just like you say, it was no radio play. Everything was ma mainly underground. You know, me living in a in a uh, tourist destination, which is Miami, when people would come down on spring break, college students, they would be playing in the clubs, and then those college students would then take the music back to where the, wherever they live at, as well as their universities, and that's how the music basically spread it around the country. Well, that's pretty crazy about how you actually created the parental advisory sticker. So you actually designed that? You got together with a designer and, and actually made the black and white logo? Yes. Okay. Was there any sort of issue with everyone else using it? Because th that's still, I think, used today. Yes, it's by used. By every label, it, pretty much. It's used right now today. I mean, the uh, RIA adapted it, and uh, they acted like they tried to take a little bit of ownership of it. But, again, I should have patented it. And then, you know, I, I, I had no idea that it would be as big as it is right now because my whole thing was not allowing kids to get the music and I came up with the idea because it was a similar sticker that they use in the uh, movie theaters where they have a NC-17, uh, the rating system. So I kind of took the idea from the rating system of the movie theaters and created a, the parental advisory sticker, uh, you know, letting stores know that these songs right here uh, uh, contain adult lyrics.